Jeffrey Watkins. We are gathered here today to obviously celebrate his legacy. And this wasn't possible for a very long time because nobody knew where his grave was. And um, it, I mean, the journey that I took was really that I was uh, offered to do a talk in London on the centenary day. He got his revelation, which he uh, described as a flood of ancestral memory, on the 30th of June, um, 1921. And on the centenary day, I offered to give a talk in London. And I'm involved with lots of cemeteries in London, uh, trustee of four of them. And um, first thing I ask when somebody mentions somebody knows, I say, where are they buried? And nobody knew where Watkins was buried. I phoned up the archives in Hereford. Nobody knew. I phoned up around in the lay world. Nobody knew. Um, unfortunately, I got in contact well, I've got to give a contact for Alan Charles, who is the vice chairman of the local family history society. And thankfully, they had done many years ago, they'd done an inscription record of this cemetery. And on that list was the name of Alfred Watkins. Now, they had no idea that this has got anything to do with anybody famous, but that, I picked that up immediately. They're the only thing was it was in the wrong part of the cemetery. Now if you look at the listing here, that's what he's, we've got in the cemetery there, the archive there. Um, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, Alfred Watkins died aged 80 years. He was a master miller, that's what it's got down here. Died at Five Harley Court, uh, uh, lived at there as well also you've got the two addresses side by side on the 7th of April and on the 10th of April 1935 when it was 80 then he was buried in this St John's plot here now the map here gives you this St John's plot there and it's it's, it's there basically and there's another strip of it down there and um, I told Adrian and he came up here with um, Jeremy, I think, had a look. No chance of finding it. I still wanted to have a look. I came up with Adrian. We had another day here looking and we just got nowhere. Um, but then realised that the St Owen plot that they'd, that they'd been recorded for Alfred Watkins had been badly drawn, in fact, so that the actual lines on the map here are incorrect. So that's Alfred Watkins' grave, but in fact, the St John's section comes right over here. So that's the reason why we weren't looking in the right section. So um, that made it quite clear that, that this was a very good likelihood. So I uh, got in contact with the cemetery supervisor, Mr. Tracy Morris, and he was a bit skeptical stuff. If you imagine it all covered with this lichen, you couldn't read it, you know, it's, it, it, but he did. He, he said, well, I think, it, yeah, that's right. So um, I shot up here immediately, got here on the 7th of October last year, and yes, it was the grave. So I spent um, half a day. This was all covered, you imagine this all covered with grass, the uh, crazy paving, and it needed all cleaning down. I've done a, another couple of hours on it this morning, so you can read it a bit better. But that's why, because it was all covered up and nobody could find it. And we weren't looking in the right area, we were looking over there. So that's why we couldn't find it. So, um, and of course, the only thing it says in the archives is the St John's section. Grave number 100. Well, grave number 100 is a chronological one, so it doesn't tell you where it is, unfortunately. And the next thing, if you believe it or not, they've got maps of all the sections in the cemetery but one section they haven't got a map for, and that's the St John's section, and nobody can give an answer why it's missing from the archive over there. So otherwise, had that been in there, it might have been a bit easier to do. Anyway, the description's now readable, and I'll read it out to you. In the memory of Alfred Watkins of Hereford, son of Charles and Anne Watkins, of, it says here, Homer Park, when it actually means Holmer, so it's an L missing there, uh, Hereford, um, inventor in photography and pioneer researcher, worker in archaeology.
born on the 27th of January 1855, died 7th of April 1935. Uh, and it says at the bottom, wise, wise and just. I think that's a rather nice uh, yeah. epitaph. Short and swim, simple. Um, and his sort of epitaph in written up in the obituary said very much the same as that. He was a brusque but very fair and, and a wise person. So I think that we can say that. I mean, the things that we remember about him, obviously, is discovery of lays, straight tracks. I mean, he wouldn't have understood the development of lays, uh, you know, the energies and things like that. But that, that's neither here nor there. But in his day, he was internationally famous for in inventing the first usable light meter, the B meter. And that was used all over the globe, used on Shackleton's and Scott's and various other um, expeditions around the world. And they couldn't have done it, they said, without the light meter. And he invented lots of other um, useful things, tanks, timing devices, um, calculators. Um, and he was a pioneer in uh, moving footage. He went and visited um, uh, uh, down in uh, Chester, I think it was uh, William Rice Green, is what it was, his name. Well, he, he pioneered moving footage and um, got his own moving camera. And you've got some early photographs, moving pictures in, in Hereford, and also a vast archive of bygone age of all around here in the practices and houses and things that have been now since knocked down. But as far as his photography is concerned, I say he's internationally known, he has a whole section devoted to him uh, in the most major photographic um, museum in the world, in, in New York. So I think that's a, a, a tribute that few can equal. Yeah, so I'm glad to be here. And, um, it's the first time, really, a crowd of people have visited and paid tribute to him. Do you think this stone would have been standing up at one time? No, I don't. There are other monuments like this, and mm. I've come across it in other cemeteries. Okay. Um, initially, when I was up here searching with Adrian, I said, well, he's a big figure in Hereford. He was a Justice of the Peace, County Councillor, um, Governor on... Uh, you know, in, in, in various uh, schools and such like. Mm. Um, he was the president of the Woolhope Club. So uh, are we looking for a, a big granite monument yeah. somewhere in a prominent yeah. position? No, but it's sort of a bit laid back. And I think, obviously, um, he was, he invented all sorts of things, not only for photography, but also he in, invented a dough meter but they had a milling concern. So his father, Charles, came from outside of Hereford, enormously successful entrepreneur, set up business in hospitality, um, milling and brewing. And Watkins developed this dough meter so he could work out what's the right time to start baking um, and various other improvements. So he was a very inventive person. Here's to Mr. Watkins. Yes, sir. Here's Mr. Mr. Watkins. Watkins. Yes. 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 Um, Alfred Watkins' birthplace. The house where he lived from 1925 to We were then to find, incredibly, that the grave was at the crossing point of two lays, one of which runs east-west through Hereford Cathedral, the tower of which is visible from the grave. The other runs north-south through the cemetery chapel, also visible. Alfred Watkins would have called these cardinal point alignments. Well, you're not going to believe me, but 
that church is exactly north of here. The north running lay first goes to Wormelow Tump village. The Tump was a mound which local tradition holds was the burial place of King Arthur's son, Amir. The Tump was flattened to widen the road in 1896. Alfred Watkins writes, a curious legend connecting surveyors and sighting staves with tumuli is related by Nennius, a 9th century historian, relating to Wormelow Tump, Herefordshire. The man who is buried in the Tump was Amur, and men came to measure the Tump. It sometimes measures in length 7 feet, sometimes 15 feet, and sometimes 9 feet. Whatever measure you may make it at one time, you will not again find it the same measurement. The lay then goes through Grove Farm, half a mile to the north. It then comes to Callow Church, which is on high ground, and from the churchyard there is a good view north over the city of Hereford. The church dates from 1830, however it was altered in 1884. It's on the site of an earlier church, but there seems to be no record of the age of it. Alfred Watkins writes, Other churches such as Brinsop, Callow, Dewsall, Aikenbury, Sollers Hope, Longtown, Yatton, Marden, Madley, Mathon, apparently orient on lays. From here it goes through Alfred Watkins' grave and the cemetery chapel, and then on to St Margaret's Church, Wellington. The original parts of this church are Norman, but there were additions over the 14th and 15th century, with major renovation taking place in the late 19th century. St Margaret of Antioch has a legend of killing a dragon. Alfred Watkins writes of another lay going through Wellington Church. Standing in a gap, hill notch, in the southwestern corner of the Vallum Ditch of Sutton Walls, I noticed that Marden and Wellington Church towers were in alignment to it, and continuing the lay on the spot to the southeast by sighting rods, they sighted to the highest wooded point in the Woolhope Range, probably Seager Hill. Then the lay goes to the Priory Church in Lempster, dedicated to St Peter and St Paul. The building was constructed as for a Benedictine priory in about the 13th century, although there had been an Anglo-Saxon monastery in Lempster, possibly on the same site. In 1539 the east end of the church was destroyed along with most of the monastic buildings, but the main body of the church was preserved. Watkins writes, confirming the north-south lay through the church. A north and south lay through Lempster was found, which, passing through the churchyard, just escaped the present building. But it passed through the foundations of a Saxon apse, which has been excavated. He'd found the lay, which was later to pass through his grave. The east running lay goes through a named crossroads, Handley's Cross, which has one of its roads coincident with the lay. I was unable to find any explanation for this name. And then on to a point where the course of the Roman road, Stone Street, crosses a minor road. The Roman road is not visible on the land here, but the minor road makes a semicircular kink at this point. After passing through Alfred Watkins' grave, it then reaches St Nicholas Church in Hereford. It's an early Victorian building on the site of an ancient Saxon church. The origins are unknown. It may have existed before the Norman conquest of 1066. The original font was brought here from the old church. It was re rebuilt from the ground up in 1842. Alfred Watkins mentions that Hereford Cathedral is oriented to it. The next point on the lay is Hereford Cathedral. It then goes through a crossroads at Longworth. Finally, the lay reaches St Andrew's Church at Pixley, hidden behind farm buildings, which dates to the late 13th century and consists of just a chancel and nave with simple Victorian bell turret at the west end of the nave. The first recorded mention of a minister at Pixley comes from 1278, when the church is mentioned as a chapel of Eads, for Ledbury. 
There is a small south porch, and recent tree ring analysis shows the timbers used in its construction were felled in the winter of 1467. Intriguingly, large stones used in the northeast corner of the chancel suggest that it was once part of an earlier building, but if so, no other trace of that structure remains. In the medieval period, Pixley Court was a moated manor, and the moat probably encircled both the manor and the church, so this could also qualify as a moat.